want to do today is I've broken this up so that there are a number of, of bits to camera in a sense, but also um, an opportunity to chat. And so I think with I think we've got about three people on the, the three others with Madeline, apart from Madeline and myself. So we'll be able to just run that um, uh, with the group as we stand. But it may well be um, that we want to have some breakout rooms. And if if more people join us, we'll actually probably break people into uh, pairs to discuss certain things. So that's the that's just by way of, of introduction. I retired from the Queensland University of Technology uh, in 2016. I'm now working. Um, I, I slid into this a uh, role where I'm working with an online education provider at the moment called Cadenza, and they're a, an online provider dedicated to uh, the arts, creative arts, and design. Um, creative education and creative technology. So this heartbeat of being involved with the arts certainly continues for me. I, I wanted to just um, let you know that uh, I've been involved with the Teaching Artist Movement and what is the International Teaching Artist Collaborative now since the beginning. And in 2014, we hosted here in Brisbane the second International Teaching Artist Conference. And you, it's probably, it's an interesting thing. So this is a, a five year, uh, five years ago, we were looking at this. And one of the things that we, we were trying to do um, back then in, in, in terms of what we were, what the aspirations were, is we wanted to see if we could consolidate this work called teaching artistry. And, and they come from a document that was part of the planning for that conference. And, and quite honestly, I think today in this webinar is ev evidence of all of those points, trying to join up the field, um, people from different parts of the world, deepen our understanding of practice, trying to unify the field so funding bodies get what we do, um, because funding remains a key issue for teaching artists. And then this idea of can we build deeper pools? We tend to live in shallow pools in the arts, um, and it's a terrific opportunity to build deeper pools within, te within which teaching artists can thrive with a greater security. So, so <clears throat> in a sense, today, all of us are part of that sort of ongoing narrative that was actually started at the first Teaching Artists International Conference in, in Norway. So, with that in mind, what I, I thought it would be interesting to do just first up, and I think we can just run this now, if you're comfortable with it, just, uh, you know, in the, the, the people we have here. So, what I'd like you, so we won't run this in pairs. We were thinking, you know, if we had more than about five or six, we'd, we'd break this into pairs. And maybe this is going to get tricky if people join us later. But... Essentially, what I thought we'd, we'd try to do is just have a quick introduction um, and if each of you could come on and just say, look, hello, this is, I, I'm here, a little about your teaching artist background, what this seminar, webinar is, in, what's been curious about that, and one TA project you've been involved with recently. Actually, I see there is another person joining us, Carol. Um, greetings, Carol, and um, I, uh, I, I hope you can hear. Um, so with that, Madeline, maybe it is worthwhile trying to do this in pairs using the breakout room uh, capability of... Sure. of yeah, um, yes, absolutely. Uh, is, is everyone, could you just give a thumbs up if everyone's comfortable to do this next step so that because part of it is for you to meet each other as well as, um, and, and I think what's going to happen is that the Zoom, Zoom's algorithm will match you, will put you, uh, won't match you, it'll just put you oh, there in, I am. Uh, in a particular um, breakout room. So uh, with luck, it, you'll be meeting somebody on another part, in another part of the world that you haven't caught up with yet. So um, Madeline, are you able to um, Here we go. work that, that magic? Yeah, here we go. Uh, recently, my husband and I have been working with veterans 
uh, who have uh, experienced trauma of various kinds, especially unseen wounds of war, uh, PTSD, and then other uh, diagnoses like uh, bipolar and schizophrenia as well. Um, we do our show, My Father's War, which is based on my father's World War II memoir. That's a jumping off okay. point and opens people up. And from there, we do, we've been doing a, a four-month residency of writing um, and uh, mapping some visual arts and uh, kinds of work, but mostly writing workshops. And we have our culminating event next Tuesday. Okay. Uh, oh, that, Veteran that, Recovery Center, which is part of the yeah. Veterans Administration. And whereabouts, whereabouts are you, Carol, in the States? Oh, sorry, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, yeah, US. lovely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, that's terrific. How long have you been working as a teaching artist? Since 1987. Okay, terrific. Yeah, yeah. All right, everyone's, everyone's back. Yes, I can see you all in the side, in the side bar, so that's terrific. What, I'll, what I'd like to do now is, now you've had an, an opportunity to kind of meet at least one other person. And in order to provide a teething ring to discuss this question of evidence, um, I'd like to take a few minutes to walk you through, um, give you uh, the, the idea of a teaching artist project I've been involved with. And it started when I was working at the university and it's, uh, and, and it's actually continued until today. Um, and it was a, a sexual health promotion program in Papua New Guinea. So if you don't know where Papua New Guinea is, that's the map. And you'll see that it, it, it actually, this is the northern peak of Australia. So Papua New Guinea is this slice and a cluster of islands around here. It's, um, it's an extraordinarily beautiful country. But it's a country with a lot of challenges. Um, and, and those challenges, as you would expect, uh, come from economic development, but also the legacy of colonialism. So, um, you know, the Germans actually uh, were the colonial protectors. World War I, after World War I, Australia took over as a protectorate of, of Papua New Guinea. Uh, diamonds, gold, oil. So it's a very, potentially very rich, quite a bit of corruption in the place. And typically very, um, it's almost misogynistic, I think. The men are the, um, are very much the, the, they, the it is a society organised for them. And yet you, it won't surprise any of you to learn that women do most of the work. So it's actually a very tough, Place to work, um, uh, and uh, but I've been in and out of there for for nearly ten years, um, and that's the project that was we were funded. We received a, a significant uh, research grant funding to look at sexual health promotion, um, and we were using performance uh, as teaching artists. We were using performance to work with young people. Um, the team, there was a medical, an educational, and a performance component to the team we worked with. And we had the, the, the task was, was a curious one because a lot of the, what was happening is there were fly-in, fly-out workers uh, into the gold mines, and there was a spike in HIV being reported. So part of this was addressing that. And a lot of the health promotion work was fairly clumsy. You know, a, a leading footballer standing there with a condom on his thumb saying safe sex is important. And it'll come as no surprise that that didn't work very well at all. So, so that's what we went to. I think we were first in there in 19, in, 19, um, uh, in, in I think 19, um, uh, sorry, I'll just go back to that one. Um, so it was a practical workshop-based approach, skill development, applied theatre, applied performance, experiential learning and behaviour change. That's what we were working towards. And in Australia, this term, teaching artistry, certainly back then wasn't popular or, or um, evergreen. 
Um, it's very much one that's been built over time. For us, we th think of ourselves typically, and most teaching artists would see themselves as being involved in community cultural development or community arts and cultural development. And, and the last sentence goes to the core, the heart of that. What is at the core of this practice, however, is a collaboration between professional artists and communities to create art. So I'm sure that's, that resonates with everyone. Um, and we, we set the task of, of building three components. So we worked, we wanted to take, make, create programs and life drama materials in two particular provinces, Tari in the Southern Highlands, Kakar Island in Medang. We wanted to design and publish resource materials that were the, both for the university curriculum but community education, and we were conducting training the trainer models for life drama programs. And I can tell you the work's gone very, it's been, it's been extraordinary work, it's been quite slow, but it needed to be because I'm sure you're all imagining, wow, this is an extraordinary complicated and a complex project and what on earth are a bunch of white people doing flying in and flying out uh, to Papua New Guinea to do this work. And, and in fact, um, it was only after we'd been up there for a couple of years, I'd probably spend a month, a year up there. So, uh, you know, I wasn't full time. And it was only after a couple of years that they said to, they said to me, of course, you, you know, we, we consider you to be pelicans. Uh, and I went, Pe pelicans? What, 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 where did that come from? And they said, well, you're pelicans. You're white, you have fat, fat bellies, and you fly in and fly out. So th there's a lovely, um, there's a lovely um, sort of reflexivity and cynicism, a healthy cynicism and a wariness of we pelicans who, who want to be do-gooders at the same time. So that's what, and, and um, just to finish off, I'm actually going up there for the last time the week after next, because all of the materials and resources have been produced, uh, they've finally been printed up, and the University of Goroka, which is in the Highlands, it's, um, it's, it's taking the project over now. And I've had three students who've gone up and are working up there so it's been quite a successful project, not only in teaching artistry, but in, um, you know, uh, in, in a whole range of university collaborations and, and research outputs. Um, so we worked in two sites. This is, I'll just go through these. These are the sorts of um, experiences. We landed in Tari and we were welcomed by the community. Um, it, and, and many of this will, this, these images will look very familiar. If you're involved in particularly drama or performance-based work, you can see this work and a lot of activity around games and uh, games and exercises um, that, uh, that, that um, well, sorry, oh, Microsoft's not responding. Uh, there we go. Um, so there's there's me in full flight in the in the jungles. Um, uh, we were on an island, an island called Kakar Island. It has cholera, um, volcanoes, venomous black snakes. It, it's like something out of a, a comic from the fifties. Um, and uh, actually, the, the young woman I'm speaking with is Jane. She's now a lecturer at Garoka, and she did her PhD as part of this project. Um, so these give you the sense of what we did. Uh, this is Andrea. She, Andrea has a health background. Uh, she's drama as well, but has a health background. So interdisciplinary teams were absolutely essential. And this is Hayley. She is white, obviously, white Australian uh, drama teacher. And she also did a PhD and finished that. And, uh, you know, doing some mask work around stigma um, in, in that workshop. So it just gives you a feel for what we were doing. So what, what I was wondering now, and I think if we all feel we could, we could just chat or we could go back to the breakout groups, but now you've had a chance to get a sense of that. What I was thinking it might be fun to do uh, would be to imagine that in pairs, you're both members of the funding panel who allocates funds for teaching artist projects in Papua New Guinea. And Life Drama is applying for funding to continue working. So what you've seen, which is descriptive, it still holds. 
And so the things that would be interesting for you to consider would be to help you decide whether to continue their funding, what questions would you have for the Life Drama team? And what evidence will you need from them to demonstrate the impact of their work in Papua New Guinea? Uh, I will say you'll have heard impact, of course, it's the term, uh, you know, what's the impact of our work? And it's, a, it's straight away, it's a very clumsy term, isn't it? Because, you know, you get impact, you think typically of collision, and it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's a word straight from business, of course, and, and, that, and, and that business. Um, so, so I just thought what might be interesting, and, and perhaps if Carol, rather than Carol and I, uh, I mean, we can continue to talk, or maybe Carol could, uh, Carol Ponder could actually, um, Madeline, be assigned to just one of the other breakout teams, so it would be a group of, so if we, how many have we got here? Three, is that right? I think it might be better to do Let's a group stay. just because one microphone is down, and so yeah, it might yeah, yeah. to have a sort of group chat slash messaging system where we all just sort sure, of check in. Sure. No, well, I think, I think, and if that microphone's down, we can still listen and, and then use the chat function. So sure. why don't we just stay where we are and um, see how we go in raising the sorts of the things that would crop up if you're a funding body and you are considering further funding for life drama, what, what, what evidence do you need from life drama to demonstrate the impact of the work? Uh, Brad, it's Elise. I would like to know uh, how long the program has been going on, what you, what you had as baseline research mm -hmm. that, that you could then compare, you know, do a follow-up and compare the number, age groups, sexually active, not sexually active, um, and any numbers of people infected with uh, sexually transmitted diseases and if that number changes. Yep, yes, yes. So baseline data that allows you to have a comparative base in a sense. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. In addition to um, quantitative data, I would, I think, also want to see um, interviews or surveys or uh, evidence that people were um, understanding and communicating with others and uh, in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a balance of qualitative and quantitative. Yep, yep. I also think I would like to see a comparison from prior to say the commercial scientific knowledge uh, showing why an arts program mm. has uh, or how that differs in the impact from uh, prior efforts. Yep. Absolutely. Yes, the particular dynamics that get created when you're working through and in the arts and, mm -hmm. and how might that nudge things, yeah. Any last thoughts? I mean, all of that obviously is, is absolutely on the money. Um, I, I don't know what your relationship with the, the government was, but is uh, some sort of comparison with your data, with their data, um, I, I don't know what the connection was, but... Sure. But, but there, there are agencies, the National AIDS Council, for instance, in uh, New Guinea, they, uh -huh. they gather data and they approach... They're, they're a very um, clinical. That they use clinical medical models of, of this. So mm -hmm. they do have that data, yes. So it, it could be what data can align and what, how, what can, how did that compare? And in fact, point to the sorts of things that Elise was raising um, mm -hmm. around comparisons. Right. I also think there's great value in having reflections of participants in the program to, it's, it's very hard to categorically uh, measure some of these things and uh, say, well, this is because of the arts versus this is not because of the arts. So I think uh, reflective analyses are also very important. Yeah, 
Okay. And, and yes, you're quite right. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure there's ever been any studies which have really, you know, proved beyond doubt that the influence of an arts program has been the causal significant change. Most of the connections are through correlation. Um, I, I think the couple I have seen that have been sort of most robust are around drama on language development. So mm -hmm. there seems seem to be the capacity to shift role seems to be important. Um, and there's also some around music, I understand. Okay. But, well, let, that's, I mean, I think that's, um, that's terrific. Let's, let's move forward on that. And it won't come as a surprise to you that what we were seeking to do was provide evidence of quantity in the first instance. So people have already mentioned quantitative research. So what we did is that we, one of the things to establish baseline data very early is that we set up a questionnaire that we then number crunched through statistical programming. And as you can see, these are all very, these are fundamental questions. Um, it, it is an interesting thing. And I think, to be quite frank, it reflects the kind of male, uh, you know, the male weight and centre of gravity for the society where the, the one of the, when we were up there the very first time, most people talked about female condoms. So um, this was not male condoms particularly, um, but female condoms. I don't know if any of you have ever had an experience with a female condom, but it's a pretty, um, a pre pretty uh, uncomfortable thing, I must say. I, I actually... Um, suggested to my wife after I came back from a trip, we should just see how this works. And she said, no way on earth. Is that <laughs> Research. <laughs> I, I did not. say that in a very plaintive voice, but, I, but it's interesting that, you know, that they're handing out female condoms as, as well as male, you know, and, and so this goes to the broader cultural debate. And this is really where the project sat, you know, it, it wasn't so much about, you know, the clinical interventions, it was about these cultural uh, dynamics. So, you know, what we did is we were then, and, and we then with, with uh, Andrea particularly, we went, we, we, we did a baseline thing, we did our program, our workshop program, standard stuff that you would do really, um, and we did that and it was a two week program and at the end we tested them and we looked at where there, was pos where there were positive changes and we were able to quantify that. And so that gives you the quantitative stats on the impact we were having early on, um, which is where we did this and how do we, and, and there are a couple of things around no change. I mean. There was one of the very strong moments is there was, you know, the idea that this is through an exchange of bodily fluids and what is the nature of that and the potency of it uh, wasn't understood. So we were working with a lot of community groups, church leaders, schools, um, and this information was coming, this data was gathered um, from them in the program. But a, a very powerful moment was when one of the... Um, uh, and, and we used, we worked with um, people in the community as well. And there was a very powerful moment where one of the person who was HIV positive um, and had declared herself as such and was working uh, in the workshop with us um, and one of the leaders who wasn't and they deliberately, uh, without making a fanfare of it, drank out of the same can of Coca-Cola. And, and that caused great reverberation among the group, um, fearing that that was how it, it could come. Uh, it's also a sorcery. It remains while there's a lot of missionary-based Christian work, um, uh, you know, there's a strong sorcery-based approach to cosmology and, and the world of the spirit. So, um, you know, there are witches and shape-shifting animals that move through walls. So it's a, you know, you're, you're really wrong-footed as a white Westerner, uh, a product of the Enlightenment, 
quite wrong footed. Anyway, we can talk about that more and more, but it just, it, it points to what we were experiencing after the first couple of years of doing this work. Um, we also wanted to, to get e evidence of quality. I'm sorry, that should be quality. And what we did is we did exactly as you suggested, Carol, a number of interviews with people. And of course, there were often three languages going. There was their own tribal language, there was Pidgin English, and some had um, English. So uh, this all was very layered in its complexity and how we addressed that. So how, what, what, and these were contextual matters about what do people understand, what would they do? And so that last question, if a member of the family got infected, would you want it to remain a secret? And these were the kind of, um, these were the overwhelming risk cultural responses to the, dile to, to the dilemma, which of course, you know, in a program seeking to do this, how do we use this not just as content, but how do we seek to address the underlying issues? Now, there's a lot in that and we won't pick it up other than to say what we were doing then is we were, and probably for the first, you know, two, two and a half years up there, we were clearly finding evidence of quantity, which Swant says, you know, something is a quantity or an amount, for example, in numbers, graphs and formulas. So, you know, we were, we were doing that and Andrea was doing even more of that around the working with the clinics and gathering quite specific anonymized data around infection rates and the like. We were also looking at quality, the qualitative data, which has been defined by Schwant as expressing something as non-numeric data, but in the form of words. That's typically reports. Um, it's the kind of reports that get written where you will have people being reflective. Um, you know, we use some of the performance tools as means of reflection. So we would, we would ask, we would set that up and we would ask them to create tableaus and the like, photograph that, but we would seek to write that into a report for, and all of this was driven around behaviour change, and we had specific models of behaviour change that, that Andrea, as the uh, clinician and the drama person, had access to. And look, after being up there for a couple of years, together, these are the dominant and powerful forms of evidence, but they didn't seem enough. It didn't really, it seemed to be missing the central heartbeat of what we were doing and the people up there. Because there are 830 tribes in, in Papua New Guinea and the, the everyday theatricality and performance, performance is a way of connecting with the spirit world, um, with, with a larger order of cosmology. And so um, here we are doing, you know, white western workshops and boal and it just felt that we were missing uh and and if the research was only reporting and the evidence base was only in quantitative and qualitative we were really missing uh the the, the sort of core of what was going on in the country and their own theatricality so so and, and i mean some of this stuff is is is, you know, it's wildly exotic, it's extraordinarily entrancing. The, where we worked in Tari with these guys, these are, the, um, the, these are, uh, are from Tari, they paint their bodies, they, these are called the wig men, they actually keep their hair from adolescence and make these huge wigs in the shape of boats. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, these, are the, these are from Garoka, these are the Garoka mud, mud men and they, it came from tribal warfare and they were hiding. These men escaped from one tribe, escaped, lay in the mud, people walked past them. And then they'd build these extraordinary, uh, like, like space helmets with tusks and stuff. So, you know, so it was just crazy for us to be thinking, we're really up here having this big impact when in fact all of this is swirling around in the culture. So, and, and I was getting quite glum at one point. I thought, what, have you got to come and live up? How do we access this and, and, and on what terms? And then fortunately, almost by accident, 
we came across the work of Round Round Theatre from the 1980s. And what the Round Round Theatre did is they were a theatre company based in Garoka, where they brought actors and performers, dancers, musicians from the various tribal groups to create to, to create work to transform um, what was actually these transforms. So that's what was, um, that's the way this was devised. And they called these folk operas. And in fact, Round Round traveled the world. They, they, they were enormously effective. They performed in one of the San Francisco performances. They were at an Edinburgh festival, I understand, Madeline. Um, they performed in Brisbane and, and throughout Australia, and the work was compelling. And they called them folk operas, and folk operas were, as you can see there, they, they identified three forces at work in the traditional performance, um, and, and there was story force, picture force, feeling force, and, and, and the, Greg Murphy, who he was... He, I, I finally discovered Greg, he's still living in Papua New Guinea, an Australian who worked with Round Round Theatre. And so this was very rich for us. Suddenly, we felt we had some keys into the <clears throat> aesthetic and sensuous dimension of the lived experience in Papua New Guinea. Something that the quantitative and qualitative data could never capture. Now, this was the other fact that the, all the actors whose bodies were culturally informed, they'd maintained contact with their own cultures and they'd tapped into this long cultural memory. So what Round Round did and what we did is then we, we it was like getting the band back together. We, we then, <laughs> in 2000, and I think it was 11 or 12, we got a number of these Round Round actors, we gathered them together in Medang and we had a two week workshop with them where we learned from them. So we had people who were dancers from Siasi. So these were people who were round round performers, but you know, back in the eighties. So we had people who were Siasi dancers, people who used the art and ceremony from the Gulf communities, the Eastern Highland, the Simbu fast traditions of performance and playful, very playful um, trickster cultures uh, up there. The Trobians dance and stories, big yam festivals, Manus dance and the Garamak music and uh, Kawaii dance and the Godala design. So all of these we were able to reconnect. But our intention wasn't necessarily to create shows using this, to reinvent Round Round uh, with a theme of HIV and AIDS. But how might we take these traditions and repurpose them and infuse them into workshop programs. So we, we create them. And, and what I'm sharing with you now is, is the way in which we decided to report this and the evidence of what we did. So this is actually a page from um, this, this book that we produced as a, as a coffee table book. And it was a, it's a, it, so this is another form of evidence here. And this links with what we're talking about, about narrative. And we, we for instance, I, I just love that as, as, you know, one of the, the key images that we took. Mm -hmm. um, and that says more about what's happening, in my view, than any statistic or mm -hmm. any report which is written and so it can be argued that the evidence suggests that perhaps it may be you know that sort of <laughs> that sort of um stuff that funding bodies really like so so this is just gives you an insight this was an extraordinary th this was the culmination where we where we took um folk opera forms and we workshopped them and they were very keen. They wanted, this is on the village of Kakar Island. This is now applying what we'd learnt in the folk opera work. So we were applying it. And so what we did is that we ran workshops on, on what we called an epiphany folk opera, a moment of truth where, and this is very big within the culture, where, you know, the penny drops, but a really significant moment. And they developed a narrative 
around being in Ka on Kakar Island, and there are there, there are six communities on Kakar, and what they wanted to do was we were workshopping with them about enacting this story, and it's a story of somebody of a man um, here who actually. Um, thinks he may have HIV and AIDS. One of the things is no, no men go for testing. They, they would never do that. Too much shame, too much... You, you would never do that. So this is about a man who's actually been having a sexual intercourse. He's got a... a, a, a it's called a Highway Mary. She's called a Highway Mary. He's a truck driver. He stops and has sex with prostitutes by the road. It's very common. Uh, and particularly as, you know, a lot of women just get turfed out of homes. So he's been doing that. He's, he's got many of the early symptoms of HIV and AIDS, and he has a dream. So this was workshopping all of this. This was all still part of the workshopping and sharing. Uh, here he is. Um, and this is in a dream. His daughter comes to him and says, Papa, Papa, why are you the way you are, uh, it, it turns in, they invented these things, um, these scenes and episodes where finally um, his friend says, you must go for testing after the sort of dream-like interventions. And then they said to us, could we do this in Bilas? And Bilas is traditional dress. So we said, yes, of course. So they said, tomorrow we want to come and do this in Bilas. So that's what these final set of photos reveal. So they did it again. They turned it into very much a performance, watched by the whole village and dogs and two-year-old children and the whole lot. And they performed it in Bilas. And suddenly we have a performance form that's culturally grounded and dealing with the 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 everyday uh, aesthetic and dynamic. So these are some, just to give you, this is his daughter. When they're in Bilas, this is his daughter talking to him. Um, this is, again, a moment from that. Um, and, and, I mean, I'll just say as an aside, and, and I, I trust people take this in good faith, and, you know, I, all the time I'm just blown away by this work, but I am aware I'm a white you know, heterosexual male in, in this part of the world. And here are all of this exotic performance, many in half-dress, women half-dressed, as well as the men. And I'm thinking to myself, this has to be managed so carefully um, because it's, it's kind of male, post-colonial, you know, um, every kind of um, sort of ideological frame. Uh, we could be torn apart for on this. So the ethics of this work was huge and maybe that's the subject for another conversation one day. And this was all done to, in a foreign language, it was all done in pidgin. So, so you know, it, it was, we had translators, of course, so it was, it was fine. So that gives you a sense of that. So just in terms of moving this forward then, in terms of evidence and performative evidence, what, what I developed a few years earlier was that we needed to have a species of evidence that was separate from the, the quantitative and qualitative. So I wrote a paper in, in 2007 um, where I made an argument for a third species of evidence called performative evidence. And it really captures the aesthetic, the sensuous and the you know, the, that which cannot be captured in numbers or the words of reports. So this, to me, was a form of evidence that's expressing something as, as non-numeric non data, but it's symbolic data. So it's working in the symbolic orders of the arts, other than words in discursive text. And what I mean by that is not the words in the discursive text of a, a report, a formal report. Poetry is, of course, <laughs> using words in this poetic and imagistic and, and aphoristic way. So I'm not, I'm not, so I'm, I'm actually separating words from the report, the language of the formal report, to the poetic use of language 
such as poetry and myth and storytelling. These include rich media such as still and moving images of music and sound, of material forms of practice and live action and even digital code. So it's been an attempt to say we simply cannot rely on the quantity, any, any notion that the complexity of human experience and existence can be captured simply in numbers and a particular kind of word arrangement um, is necessarily impoverished and thin. And we really need, as artists working in this field, whose practice is about impact as teaching artists, that's what concerns us. It's absolutely essential. So what I then, what I then sort of developed was, uh, and, and this is really the point of, of, of this webinar, is that it's not to say that the performative is what we should all be rushing to do now. Indeed, I think our challenge is to develop evidence plans. And the evidence plans need to capture, the, it's likely there will be some quantitative data that you need. And I think this is what life drama did. We actually had quite a lot of quantitative evidence. We had quite a lot of qualitative evidence. And we had a lot of, of the performative, which is evidence of the artistic and the aesthetic and the sensuous power of human knowing. So, so that's what I kind of mean, in a sense, by how we... And, 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 and often I have colleagues who've really seized upon this performative idea and just want to make performative data and performative evidence. And I, I think that's fine. But Elliot Eisner, great arts educator, a great American arts educator, he, he says not, he has a wonderful, wonderful phrase at one point. He says, not everything can be said with anything. So these, are, for me, are the three anythings we need to say the everything about our practice. Does that make sense? So it's not just these, not just two, and it's not just the performative alone. We need to be skilled in gathering evidence around these three species of evidence and forms of reporting our work. So I'll pause there and we can open this up for a while. I see too we're coming up, so I'm not sure how much time we have left, but um, I'll just open this up now and we'll take some questions and, and, and share comments. Elise is ready to go. Thank you. Um, Brad, I always collect a lot of performative data. Um, however, I don't always find that, that that's what the funders will use. Uh, that's what PR people use, but they want to see how the performative data relates back to quantitative data. They want so so. If you could tell me that that amazing um, culturally based performance, which I think is is brilliant, if you can now say because of showing that in so many towns, the number of men going for HIV testing has increased by 5%, 10%, whatever it is. That to me is what, at least in my neck of the woods, the funders sure. want to see. Sure. Otherwise they go, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, um, I'm sorry. I, uh, that's beautiful mean, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 come, I'll, I'll come to that very quickly. Um, to answer that question, I think one of the things that we have to do is this data allow the way we use this data, we can tailor it for particular audiences. And funding bodies are one of those. So uh, I, I take that. One of the things is that often the performative data can work exceptionally powerful with other key stakeholders. So like parents, for instance. Mm. So oh, the absolutely. And, and you raised a good point. It's a very important, the way you present this isn't advocacy. It's not just this is PR of what I do. This is revealing something about knowing and consciousness that's played out through the particular form, art form. So that, that's point one. Point two is, uh, well, point one is what it gives us is the opportunity to curate the data sets we have 
that and target them for particular and appropriate uh, different stakeholders. Funders are a stakeholder. So it is very important to do that, to make the point that it's very unlikely that in any of the social sciences you can prove causal link. But the other thing we did too is we then, do, using folk opera forms, we then worked, and this is where our PhD students came in, they then worked and travelled into the highlands in Papua New Guinea, right? Now, men don't go to that. Men won't do it. So we have, and this is where the performative data even enriches and enlivens the quantitative data. So we've, they have, the UN funds a number of HIV testing teams, and these are clinical teams of three that go from village to village, and they set up a mobile testing booth, and men don't go. So the participation rates are extremely low, quantitatively. We had this extraordinary event where in one of those villages, the life drama, um, they worked with a folk opera form, they turned it into a, this is a village with no electricity, so there's a generator up, two lights, uh, people with torches even, and what they did is they did the performance, the village elders got up and spoke, all of this was being recorded and filmed, the village elders got up and said, this is really important, we must do this, and then the testing body said that the testing clinic opened and there was a queue of 14 men. Wow. So statistically, we can show the rate had, incre had increased. But the evidence of that queue <laughs> of, of the t clinic, the testing centre sitting on three logs with their rubber gloves on and pricking thumbs and doing it under torchlight is enormously powerful, even for that link between the quantitative and the the, the performative. It would seem. So I don't know if that. I, I don't know if, if it helps. No, that's exactly what yeah. I was asking. It's Good. because then you do have something that's quantitative. Yes. About by your performative, I do a lot of work with special populations with uh, students with disabilities and. <laughs> The performative data is immense. The quantitative data, being able to measure uh, advances in some of these populations, is very, very difficult. Yes. So when I'm approaching funders and say, you know, they they want to see growth or proof, and you know, whereas I may see that it's on a very different uh, mm. measure measurement scale. So yeah. when you're telling me, you're, you told me exactly what I wanted to hear okay. that it did your performative data. And the, and the other thing that I've I, I found and Andrea had this, is like there is, I think, it's called the positive change model. It's a social science model. And there's quite a lot of work done on changing communities and the, the capa there's a, a, a UN and it's a model for development around capability development. It's really useful to connect with interdisciplinary colleagues and show how, that, because those models aren't quantitative. And, and you know, there's deep suspicion of any any quantitative model that's like if we had that and that really worked wouldn't the world be a different place you know <laughs> so so it, it is about and, and again i go back to uh, eisner some things you know what are the you know some things tell you some things tell you other things better than other things if that mm -hmm. makes sense thank you no no pleasure a anything um, if, if there's nothing else, and I just sort of indulge, we can take it, indulge it. This idea of performative data, just to say, it's not just from teaching artists and it's not just from us. Artists are doing this now all the time in many different fields. So this is uh, a box of uh, the artist Pippalotti Risk. I don't know if you know Pippalotti Risk. She's a digital new media artist. She, we went to a, a, an installation she did, and this was the box of materials that goes with the exhibition, with the installation. Um, we, we bought it and, and it's, I gotta say, it's one of the most precious things my wife has. She loves this, she'll get it out and pour over it like a, a box of jewels. So this is just, these were, this is the, this is data, it was in the box. So this has nothing to do with teaching artistry, this has nothing to do but it is all forms of evidence how things were developed 
and it's full of rich material that is performative in the way, like a coaster with the P for the, you know. So this is all refracting and reverberating uh, out of the, um, out of, and, and this is an impulse in contemporary art, not solely. So we're not, you know, I'm, I'm saying we can align ourselves with strong artistic traditions in this work. I, I will show you this. I mean, I, I, one of our best companies in Australia is Napoji, is, is a company called Big Heart. And this is what their, their group of teaching artists and they work in companies, in, they work in, in community. They do a lot of indigenous work. And so, and, and so going back to that ethics question, they just will never go in and do a two week workshop. What they do is they seek a commitment. They make a commitment to work with the community for three years. So the, the longitudinal change is significant. And this memory basket, which is a tin, it's a tin basket that they've created. Um, and I'm just trying to see that you can, it, it, what they did at the end of this, this was obviously used for funders and for, for government departments. They weave in language development policy. This is all First Nations Aboriginal people. Um, these are the people they worked with. Napaji Napaji, where it turned into a performance. It's called um, I Give to You, You Give to Me. Um, and, and so they had, it was full of, of things. This is actually the bottom of the tin box. So it's, it's reproducing the weaving. This here, all, all of members of the community who were involved got one of these. So they, the fun, they got one of these. This, for instance, is they made a huge... Um, canvas painting, all of the community, which they then cut up and turned into a badge that every community member who performed and was in it got. Um, so I won't, I won't go into it other than, you know, it's just full of this lovely rich material that keeps the, the, the work living on. Fabric iron-on transfers. Um, and so I, I think we won't obviously do this now. I, I don't think we probably need to, but I was thinking it would be really interesting to take one of your projects, like the Veterans Project, Carol, that we mm -hmm. discussed, and go, okay, what, uh, what might you think through of an evidence plan? And how might we bring these three um, species of evidence uh, together? So... That's kind of the shape of what I wanted to say. So I don't know if there are further questions or any reflections on this and what this might have triggered. Um, I'd, I'd be really happy to hear them uh, as we're kind of getting close to uh, the time. Hey, I do have a question. I, as I said, I do collect a lot of performative data, yeah. but I, I guess when it comes down to it, it's that fine line between showing it as data yeah. or, or being promotional. Yes. And I think, you know, as teaching artists, yeah, have to be able to promote your, you know, I'm, I'm a teaching artist and an administrator and I have to be able to promote my business, but there is that fine line to me because mm -hmm. I end up sometimes feeling that, um, to me, it's performative data, and other people may be just be seeing it as uh, flag waving. Yeah. Look, um, I, any ideas? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think we need to have a certain set of guidelines mm -hmm. around how we build and use performative data. So, mm -hmm. for instance, um, one of the things is that it, it it shouldn't be advocacy, and anything that is is about like anything that is about promoting the work for its own sake or, you, you know, just uh, we, we must watch that and make sure that, that that isn't there. One of the things, for instance, is not to overplay the emotional charge. So, for instance, one of the dangers of, of even the, of the life drama work is people can be completely entranced by the exoticism of it. 
Mm -hmm. So how do you, in the construction of the performative data and the commentary, how do you deprivilege that aspect? So that, you know, all of those circumstances are at play, but you're not using them to lead the case you're trying to make. Um, one of the things I personally hate and, and just feel very manipulated about is if, for instance, in uh, Carol, Carol works with veterans, right? Uh, one of the things I would hate is if a performant piece of performative data was included that had a veteran, and it may have been entirely authentic and appropriate, but, an, a, you know, you capture on camera a veteran completely breaking down, uh, yeah. just dismembered. You know, don't show that. I don't want. I don't want to use that as performative data. I, I don't want to feel no. I've been dropped into the middle of someone's nervous breakdown or someone's funeral or someone's grief. You know, so I think I, I think there are there are a number of guidelines that we and we've played with a number of those, which actually say if you're going to use performative data, um, use it in such a way that there is an objective position to it and that you're not simply sucking somebody in and hijacking them emotionally mm -hmm. because if it's advocacy that's exactly what you want <laughs> in a sense you know, um, without without being so overt and obvious that it's manipulative working with the veterans confidentiality is um yeah. of the utmost importance and we have realized that images of any kind, at this point at least, even if they are willing, we are not willing to share. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we are willing to share with their permission yeah. uh, things that they have written and things yes. that they have created to both together uh, yeah. in groups and individually. But mm. I wouldn't show anyone their pictures. But, but you, might, you might be able to find very powerful um, digital stories where there are images that aren't of them or images ah. of combat with a voice, yeah. with their voiceover. You know, so, like, the other Ooh, thing... About, that's a great idea. Well, the other thing about this performative <laughs> data is you've got all of the... Uh, all of the... You've got all of the apparatus of artistic form at your fingertips. You know, so exactly, yeah. digital stories, um, you know, the coffee table book, um, the, the, the uh, I mean, there's, there's, this is from one company without, without going in it. This is one company that, that worked with a housing block in Sydney, tough, it's called Suicide Towers. And this is a pack of performative data that they developed and what they did for the stories of people is people chose an image. So it's, it's tenant narratives. People chose an image, right? And on the back of the postcard wrote a narrative. So this one, for instance, says, I care about everyone here in the high rise. Never thought I would. I don't know what happened. They sort of got under my skin. Now I like doing little things for them. They need it, they appreciate it. They might forget five minutes after, but at the time they appreciate it because a lot of people, nobody cares about them, couldn't care less, and they're lost and alone, and I know what that's all about too. You know, so that's that person speaking directly to you. And, and as I say, it's a whole pack of postcards mm -hmm. that is is very powerful so you know even if you're a hard-nosed funding body who wants to see the numbers um you know this has a power too you know i think just i'm conscious of time sure. um, and whether this might be the time to invite any closing statements or if there's a sort of summing up that you want to give we always move things over to an email chain afterwards that you can feel free to utilize or not utilize as you like but for the moment, I would encourage us to maybe, if there's something you're dying to say or a thought you want to get out, now's probably the moment to share that. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope it's been, you know, I know you've been, you're experienced teaching artists, so I, I doubt if any of this will be new, but maybe it'll reverberate a bit differently. It, um, it, it helped me reorganise my thoughts. 
thank you about that's, collecting it that's good I, I and thank you for the for your nodding your <laughs> our, our muted partner thank you um, um, I, I, I just say to, uh, I'll end with this. I was on the Australia Council for the Arts and we funded this work. I was on it for five years, finished in 2011. And there was a program about artists in residence that was teaching artists. And it was funded by the federal government, the federal arts minister. And it was funded as a project. I think it was a $2 million project. And, and it, it was you know, went, went into a number of places, working with kids with special needs, hospitals and the like. Um, the minister uh, at the time um, went and saw uh, the work, the teaching artists working with a group of special needs kids in Melbourne. And the worry, the time, what we were trying to do was to shift that couple of million bucks into a regular line item so it's not just a project that'll die at the end of the year, that it would become a regular funding line. And he went to, he and his entourage, they all bowled into a special needs school. I, I choke up even as I say this. They, they bowled in and he was watching, they were all sitting around and they were watching the kids do some work. These kids are special needs. And he, he started to cry. <laughs> So he kind of, and, and he was very embarrassing for him because he didn't want anyone to know. And, and there was this elaborate, uh, you know, stuff like this. And uh, he said very little, left and, and, you know, said deeply thanks and all the rest of it. And two weeks later, turned it into a line item. So, so actually that funding, of, it's now five, I think it's 10 million a year now, is, is embedded as a line item. That that the that the the thing. So I guess what I'm really saying is the 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 power of the performative, you know, and a minister for the arts who makes decisions entirely on quantitative and qualitative and all of that. He was moved by the performative, and and we should always hold to that. And we can never know really how it will affect people and what the flow on of a, from a philanthropist or a funding body might be. That's my final word. Thank you. Well, thank you. for now then, I think um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part, for signing on. We've been a really small group today, so the email chain should be pretty straightforward if you want to take it and run with it. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you very much to Brad for hosting. I think you'll all agree it gives you tons to think about and sort of muddle through and come up with questions an hour later to email. Um, I would also remind you all that you can sign up for all of these to just automatically get the links or you can keep doing it individually. But do share it with your colleagues, share it with your networks. ITAC's still growing, so our network's building all the time and we would invite you to invite as many people as you can to, to join with us and really strengthen that network. So on that note, thank you very much and I think we'll end the call here and move over to the email chain. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Best of luck. Thank Cheers. you, Madeline.